Hello again. My name is Steve Hillis, and I'll be here to tell you a little bit more about major sociological theories, beginning with our oldest uh, body of theory and research, functionalism. Functionalism was originally created by Emile Durkheim, a French sociologist, one of the founding fathers of sociology. He made a lot of contributions to the beginning of our discipline, but arguably the most important of his contributions was, well, developing what would later be called functionalism. We're not going to get into the details at this point exactly what functionalism is, but just to give you a taste, Emile Durkheim argued that societies in many respects are very much like uh, organisms, uh, that they're made up of interdependent parts. Our institutions, our organizations are very much like organs in a great body. We are just cells in a, in a great uh, organism. Society, at least metaphorically, is alive. Well, there's a lot more to functionalism than that, but at least that gives you maybe a taste of where Emil Durkheim might have been going. At any rate, Emil Durkheim uh, used functionalist analysis and functionalist arguments to study a wide range of topics, beginning with our first major uh, 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 empirical research on suicide. He went on to talk about crime, deviance, religion, and other topics as well. Not only that, but Emile Durkheim influenced his son-in-law, who was a fairly influential uh, cultural anthropologist, and his uh, son-in-law then helped pass functionalism on to cultural anthropology, where it became popular for many years. But ultimately, functionalism would have far more impact within sociology. It spread across Europe to the United States, and by the 1900s, uh, it had become a well-established macro-sociology theory in America. Now, as it went from Europe in the 1800s to America in the 1900s, it changed. The focus of functionalism changed as American sociologists like uh, uh, Talcott Parsons and Robert Merton began to fiddle and change with some of the basic arguments and ideas. Theories are like that. They evolve. They change. You get different variations. Again, remember that stuff we were talking about about making distinction between very specific theories and paradigms. Well, one of the things about paradigms is, is well, they're bodies of theory and research, a way of looking at the world, kind of a, a basic approach. Well, bottom line is, is it's, they're complicated, they're abstract, and they kind of evolve and change over time sometimes. Nevertheless, there were basic underlying arguments and assumptions that stayed fairly constant from the time of Emil Durkheim all the way uh, to the mid-1900s in the United States. Now, I will point out to you right now that functionalism is largely an historical body of research and theory. By the 1950s, functionalism became to dominate American sociology. Famous sociologists like Telcott Parsons and Robert Merton became some of the, well, leading sociological voices in the academy. They dominate, particularly in macro sociology. But by the 1960s, interest in functionalism began to wane. There were probably good theoretical reasons to challenge some of the basic ideas of functionalism. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But frankly, some of it had to do with the fact that society was changing. We were entering the 1960s, the Vietnam War, the uh, uh, civil rights movement, uh, the gay rights movement was just beginning to move, uh, to begin to uh, emerge. Times were changing, and a whole new generation of younger sociologists began to question some of the underlying assumptions and arguments made by functionalists. Functionalists, frankly, in many respects, was a very conservative uh, approach to studying society. And a lot of newer sociologists in the 1960s, well, they weren't interested in studying topics like social change, inequality, stratification, social conflict. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. They were moving more and more towards interest in other approaches, approaches like conflict theory. But our focus here is on functionalism. And the only reason I brought up the shift in approach and attitudes by American sociologists is because it had a huge impact on functionalism. Functionalism began to shrink. It was aging badly. And by the time you get into the late 1960s, very few sociologists were calling themselves functionalists. Well, functionalism was dying, or at least it was becoming comatose. It had been a major 
influential body of theory and research for, well, the ballpark of 100 years. But by the 1970s, it was largely becoming an antiquated, outdated, and forgotten approach. So why are we going to talk about it? Well, first of all, because it did have such a huge impact on the history of sociology and the emergence of, uh, of a lot of our research and a lot of our basic ways of studying society. And frankly, sometimes functionalists had very interesting things to say about the way that society works and why things happen. Maybe we made a mistake leaving all of their arguments behind. And frankly, I don't think we ever really did leave all of their arguments behind. A lot of the basic vocabulary, the basic ideas that functionalists develop are alive and well in sociology today. If you look back at Durkheim's research, you can see Durkheim hinting at ideas back in the 1800s that really didn't become part of mainstream sociology for 50, 60, 70 years. Durkheim, whatever his errors, whatever the problems with his theories, was very insightful. And frankly, a lot of other functionalists helped develop very basic core concepts in sociology, things like social norms, social values, social roles. Without their contributions, sociology wouldn't look like it does today. And that's one good reason to study functionalism. But there are other reasons as well. If nothing else, functionalism allows us to compare and contrast their arguments, their ideas, their approaches with that of other, more modern, more recent approaches. Approaches like conflict theories or interactionism. The point is, is it gives us something to compare these other theories to. It gives us another point of view, a different way of looking at society and looking at human beings. At any rate, your textbook talks about functionalism. We're going to talk about it in lecture. And you can bet you're going to see it on test as well. So in practical terms, that's maybe why you should be interested in functionalism. Our next video, we're going to actually begin to get into the, the mechanics of functionalism, the basic arguments and ideas. And we're going to talk about something called functional logic. But for right now, we're done. We'll see you next time.